Good morning, everyone. My name's Jamie Wilson. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm a newer member here at Grace, but I'm happy to be here this morning to bring you an opening message. Uh, this week with the kids, we've been reading an adaptation of one of my favorite books, uh, The Pilgrim's Progress. And uh, we've been reading this version. It's called Little Pilgrim's Big Journey. And for those of you that don't know, uh, Paul Bunyan wrote this story when he was in prison uh, for 12 years for preaching the word of God. So during that time is when he wrote this book and uh, quite to his surprise, actually, it became very, very famous. In fact, next to the Bible, it's actually the most published and translated book in the world. So if it's not on your reading list, I suggest putting it on there. Um, but this version is fantastic for the kids. The pictures are awesome. The language is really easy to understand and they've been really, really into it and really enjoying following Christian along on his journey as he faces trials and tribulations on his way to the celestial city where he will meet the one true king. Um, what's consistent through the story though is characters that help Christian along the way. Uh, characters named Faithful and Hopeful and Evangelist who are sort of constants and there for him, there for Christian when he finds himself off the path, when he finds himself in moments of difficulty and darkness. And I think for me, over the past few months, Grace has become that community for me. So I just wanted to take an opportunity to say thank you for welcoming me. Um, the reading this morning is from Psalm 95, verses 1 to 7. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Welcome to church. Grace, it's Letitia here, and I get to share with you today our giving back moment. Every Sunday, we like to take some time just to share with you about how your generosity and giving is making a real difference in our community. We have a team at Grace called Just Right, and their job is to assess needs as they arise, take a look at the funds, and see if there's a way that we as a church can help out. So the story I get to share with you um, is that a member at Grace volunteers on the board of Parkwood Gardens Neighborhood Group, and they are one of our community partners. And she learned of a need um, of a woman who was just having trouble getting access to fresh groceries. So the team at Just Right was able to give her a $100 gift card for groceries and also purchase a caddy for her to use so she could transport those groceries more easily. Uh, if this story sounds familiar to you, it's because this is the second time that we've been able to help someone in the West End neighborhood gain access to fresh groceries. So the need is there. Um, this is also a great reminder that sometimes it can be hard to spot the need and volunteering uh, with our community partners is a great way to stay connected um, and just let um, our eyes and our hearts be open to how God might be able to use us in our community. If you're interested in learning more about our community partners, you can check out www.just-right.org for more information. Hello, it's uh, good to be here with you today. Um, my name is Mark Anderson. I'm one of the pastors at Royal City Mission. Uh, it's been a really awesome experience to be partnering with Grace over this past year. 
and actually even before that, but really just more significantly in sharing space this past year. Uh, we've really enjoyed working with your staff and volunteers. And I gotta say, today is a bit of an odd experience for me, speaking to a different congregation, a different group of people, but still being in a familiar space. Um, I don't know if pre-COVID we would have had an idea for that, but now we kind of know what it's like to play a home game when you're away or an away game when you're home. Either way, it's an honor to be with you guys here this morning. Our, our scripture that we're, we're studying today is found in Luke 15, and it, it's the parable of the lost son, or it's also known as, as the parable of the prodigal son. And I often find myself drawn to Jesus' parables. Each time I spent, each time I return to them, I find a new perspective, a fresh nuance. And it, especially in times of change and uncertainty, I take comfort in the fact that a good chunk of Jesus' teachings weren't a to-do list or a theological directive, but instead a story. And a story that give us comfort, but they also give us challenge. And this morning I'll be reading from the NIV if you want to follow along. And again, that's Luke chapter 15, starting at verse 11. So Jesus continued. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth on wild, in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. Then he came to his senses. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out Go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of his serv servants and asked him, what was going on? Your brother has come home, has, has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has, he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I have been slaving for you and you have and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home and you kill the fattened, and you kill the fattened calf for him? My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. As always, before really diving into any portion of scripture, you always need to understand the context. And in particular, I think in this one, we need to understand the audience. And we find this at the beginning of chapter 15. 
We, we read, now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And then Jesus told them this parable. Actually, Jesus told them three parables in succession. He told them the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and then this one, the parable of the lost son. And often we think about these parables about being what is, about being about what is lost, which they are, but they're also about a party. You see, each one of them ends in, in a celebration, a great celebration. But I'm getting ahead of myself. First, who is the audience, right? The audience. So there's this group of people gathering around Jesus. And specifically, we know in this group that there are tax collectors and sinners. But there are also Pharisees and teachers of the law, or scribes, as they're sometimes called in this audience. And sinners is it's a pretty broad term. I think most of us would probably put ourselves in that camp. We're all sinners. But the context here would lead us to believe that it, it was people who were obviously and regularly engaged in bad or immoral behavior, culturally inappropriate behavior even. And the worst of these in this group were the tax collectors. That's why they're specifically named, right? They were considered traitors to the Jewish Jewish people because of their collaboration with the Roman Empire. And the tax collectors, they're specifically named to just give us a benchmark for how horrible this mix of people were. And so this, this group of people, this group of morally reprehensible people gather near to hear Jesus. And as, as I imagine it, when I'm reading this, this passage, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you can kind of just see them backing away Backs going up, noses kind of sticking to the air. See, it's not good to be close to indecent people. Decent people don't associate themselves with that crowd. And it's important here to make no mistake, the Pharisees and teachers of the law were decent people. They often get a bad rap because Jesus is pretty harsh on them, but Pharisees, Pharisees were well-respected and upright people in Jewish society. A parent would have been proud if their son had become a Pharisee. And I don't want to be offensive, but the reality is a typical churchgoer in North America has a lot more in common with the Pharisee than we do with the crowd who were drawing near. So in this audience, we have two groups of people, tax collectors, sinners, the dregs of society, the outsiders who are drawing near to Jesus to hear his teachings. And we have the Pharisees, the upstanding citizens, the insiders who are muttering. And this is important because this story specifically addresses insider, outsider, mentality. But we'll get to that. First, let's just dive into the story a bit. See, the parable starts by introduce, introducing us to a father who has two sons. The younger of two, the two asks his father for his inheritance. I, I have two, old, two older sisters and an older brother, but my oldest sister was always well known for saying to my parents, when you die, can I have that? She'd point to the rocking chair or whatever. But it was a regular occurrence. Whenever my parents would bring home something new, we'd all look at her and say, when they die, would you like that as well? But the, as insensitive as my sister was being in those moments, at least she was willing for my parents to die, right? This younger son wasn't willing to, to wait. He demanded his portion of the state that he was due at his father's death immediately. And the father doesn't just give the younger son the share of the property, which would have been generous. He goes over and above, and instead he divides his property between both his sons. But what's really interesting here, and 
is this word property in verse 12. When you translate it from, from the, it's translated from the Greek word bios, which actually translates better to life or existence. And in, in the original language, when Jesus was telling this, it would have been an obvious shift, but we kind of lose it in the translation because it doesn't, wouldn't have read well. But if you read it with this kind of understanding, it would read more like this. And the younger of them what said to his father, Father, give me the share of your property that is coming to me. And the father divided his life, his existence between them. The father's response in this moment, I, it's exceptional. Instead of berating his son, which I think he had a right to do, he complies. And he divides his existence and his life between them. The father willingly gives up his life for his sons and gives it to them. And not long after this sacrificial, beautiful act, the younger son abandons his family. He moves to a far off country where he spends his father's existence on wild living. And I love that, wild living. What, what does wild living mean? But as I think about it, you know, I don't actually think we're supposed to know the, the gruesome details. It's kind of like the tasteful fade to black in a movie where they spare us from the violence and the sex and the gore, right? We get the implication, but we're spared the details. The son goes away and spends his father's existence on wild living. And ultimately, it doesn't matter what he spent it on. What does matter is at the end of it, he ended up working as a hired hand, completely broke and starving. But then he comes to himself. And I love that, like, the scripture points to when he realized he was starving, he comes to himself. How often do our stomachs help us come back to the reality around us? He realizes that presently he is a hired hand and doesn't have food. And that maybe he could be a hired hand who does have food. All he has to do is return to his father who fed his workers well. And Jesus in the telling of this parable includes some of the inner dialogue of the younger son. And we hear him compose a version of the confession he's going to make. Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Notice here how he doesn't imagine returning to the father as a son. His brokenness has become his identity. The younger son imagines imagines the full consequences of his life to be permanent. A permanent loss of sonship. He resigns himself to be a hired hand. The younger son in that moment dies to himself. He actually enters into the example that was offered to him by his father, who earlier gave up his life to his two sons. And in this death, the son moves back towards the father. And I love how he doesn't have to walk all the way home. Because while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The father sees him because he's been looking, because he's been waiting for him to come back. The father goes out to meet his son and embraces him. And it's on the side of the road that the son launches into his rehearsed confession. Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father doesn't allow him to finish. He interrupts him. He doesn't allow him to voice the request of being treated and becoming a hired hand. Instead, the father gives him shoes, gives him a robe, gives him a ring and declares... My son was dead, but now is alive. The love of the father overflows and restores the son 
immediately. Robe, shoes, ring, all done immediately. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And so they began to celebrate. The father's son had returned and celebration was the only appropriate response for him. But the story doesn't end here. The two previous parables end at the celebration, but Jesus takes it a step further in the parable of the lost son because the, the two groups of people that Jesus was addressing needed to hear this. Because there's this older brother who until now is largely forgotten in the story, but he comes back and where do we find him? Jesus says he was in the field. He's a hard worker, a good, sensible son with priorities. He's an upstanding, contributing member of society. And as he returns, he hears music and dancing in the house, which is actually his house, because the father divided his property, his life, his existence between his two sons. The younger took what is his and squandered it. Everything else now belongs to the elder son. So when he returns to the field, he returns to his own house to find a party going on. And he doesn't go inside. He's suspicious. So he calls over a servant, one of his servants, to find out what was happening in his own house. And the servant says, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. And at this, the older son gets angry and refuses to go inside. I can just picture him kind of just sulking outside the light of the house, right? Just on that edge, super dramatic. And as he sulks, the father comes out to him and pleads with him, looks to make peace with him. But the son interrupts him and says, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never even gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. The older older son's response reveals that though he has stayed home, he hasn't really stayed home as a son, as an heir. He sees himself and lives himself like a hired hand of the father. He listens to his father, the one who issues commands, and he obeys them, but he doesn't obey them with the heart of a son. He's worked with the calculating mind of a laborer, waiting to get his pay for the reward, never realizing he had already received it. You even hear him disowning his younger brother, this son of yours, right? Not my brother or even your other son, this son of yours. But the father, who has been there alongside, living with his son on his son's property, has a different interpretation of the years they've spent together. He he never viewed his son as a hired hand. The father responds to the son and says, My son, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because your brother, this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. At the start of the parable, when the father shared all he had, his existence with both sons, the younger son took that life and squandered it on wild living. 
and the older son lived as if having never received it. If we take the gift of God that has been given to us, but, not do, but do not stay in touch with the giver, who is our, our Father, we begin the process of dehumanization, of losing our sonship, of our heirship, of our daughtership. The younger son realizes the wrong of his ways. He realizes that he had squandered what he'd been given, gives up, and in response, totally gives up his sonship his, and dies to himself and returns to the presence of life who is his father. And the older son who has been with the father but not realized the life he had been given misses it. Instead, he's fabricated a demanding father who withholds love from one who he believes deserves it. The older son has turned the free gift of the father into a burden of which there is never adequate compensation. And his own lack of joy, his own determination to not live has made him also a lost son. Like his younger brother, he has chosen the identity of the hired hand, but not because he squandered the father's, living on, the father's life on wild living, but because he failed to recognize the presence of the father and experience the joy that is in it. And working for spiritually or worldly rewards and not for joy and inner abundance eventually breeds resentment. We can tell ourselves that this is a pure motivation because it's a spiritual reward, but it's still a focus on a future-oriented reward. And when we do that, we miss the life that is being given to us in the here and now. I think this is why the whole strategy of turn or burn or believe or you go to hell teaching, that kind of that, that emphasis, those strategies, they're ineffective. They don't work because the message of Je when you come to Jesus that way, which you might, you have to relearn that the message of Jesus has always been come experience the joy of being in relationship with the Creator. Lay aside our pride, lay aside our version of the story and live into the life, the joy, and the celebration that has been given us for here and now. I'm sure for eternity too, but what does that matter when compared to the here and now? Many of us, like the younger son, like the sinners and the tax collectors in the crowd that Jesus was speaking to, have spent much of the life that has been given to us on wild living. And maybe this is you and it's run thin for you. Maybe it's time to recognize the emptiness in this and return to the Father, return to our Father. And I invite you to consider that and to talk to somebody about it. But maybe you're in the other camp. You're like the older son, like the Pharisees in the crowd, the teachers of the law, who have reduced the relationship with our Father, with our Creator of the universe, to that of a hired hand. To a contract where we follow for reward to a contract where we have missed the joy and the presence of being with our Creator. Maybe it's time, if you find yourself in this, in this camp, maybe it's time you lay down this version of yourself and instead live into the joy and the celebration that the Father has for us. Maybe it's time to stop fretting about the other people to whom Jesus has shown love and enter into the life and celebration that we've all been invited into. My hope is that we can start to understand the Father's perspective in this parable, the perspective of Jesus as he told this parable to two groups of people 
that really weren't two groups. There was simply one group of people who left behind the life that had been given them, left behind a father who was waiting to celebrate and for the return of each person. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for the life that you've given us. Thank you for creating us all in your image and declaring us good. Would you ask that you would make the next step in our journey clear? And as we consider what wild living we need to leave behind or what misunderstandings of your grace we need to relearn, we ask for your help in this. You are so good. And may we find our identity, our peace, our airship, our sonship in you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.